The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain and read by Namoko Nikora. Part 3 Chapter 11 Tom's Troubled Mind At noon, the whole village suddenly knew the fearful news. The story travelled quickly from man to man, group to group, house to house. The school teacher closed the school. The knife had been found. It was known to be Potter's knife. And Potter had been seen washing himself in a stream in the very early morning. When seen, he had run away. All this was very strange, especially because Potter almost never washed. All the people in the town were slowly going toward the graveyard. Tom joined them. He did not wish to go, but something seemed to force him. He arrived at the fearful place and saw the scene again. It seemed a hundred years since he had seen it before. A hand touched his arm. He turned. His eyes met Huckleberry's. Both looked away. Were they being watched? Now Tom began to shake because he saw Indian Joe. Then Muff Potter appeared. A few people saw him. They shouted. The crowd separated and Potter walked through. A village law officer was holding his arm. Potter's eyes showed his fear. When he stood beside the dead doctor, he put his face in his hands and began to weep. I did not do it, friends, he said. I did not do it. Who said that you did? A voice shouted. Potter lifted his face and looked around without hope. He saw Indian Joe and said, Oh, Indian Joe, you promised me that you would never. Is this your knife? It was held by the law officer for him to see. Potter began to fall. Men caught him and let him go slowly down to the ground. Then he said, I thought that I should come and get... He stopped, shaking. Then he said, Tell them, Joe, tell them. Indian Joe told his story. Huckleberry and Tom stood, not able to speak, and with eyes wide with fear, they expected the skies to open with a sudden storm to strike down Indian Joe. But he finished his story and stood there, living and whole. They wished to tell the truth, but they did not dare. During a week after this, Tom could not sleep well. One morning, Sid said, Tom, you talk in your sleep so much that I can't sleep half the night. Tom's face became white and he looked away. That is bad, said Aunt Polly. There is something in your mind, Tom. What is it? Nothing. But Tom's hand was shaking. He could not lift his cup. And you say fearful things, Sid said. Last night you said, it is blood, it is blood. You said that again and again. Then you said, do not hurt me. I will tell. Tell what? Aunt Polly said. I understand. It is that killing. I dream about it also. Mary said that she also dreamed about it. And then Sid stopped talking. Slowly, Tom's mind grew quieter and his sleep was easier. Almost every day during this bad time, Tom went to the jail window and gave Potter some small gift. Then he felt happier. The village people wanted to put Indian Joe in jail also. Like Muff Potter, he had been helping the doctor to carry away that dead body from its grave. But the people did nothing. All were afraid of Indian Joe. Chapter 12 Tom Shows His Kindness Tom had a new and great trouble. Becky Thatcher was ill. He was afraid 
that she might die. The joy of life was gone. He played no games. He was not interested in anything. His aunt didn't know what was wrong. She tried to find some help for him. She was always reading about health. She read about how to go to bed, how to get up from bed, what to eat and what to drink, and what clothes to wear for good health, and how to think for good health. She believed all that she read, and when she read something new, she wanted to try it. She took Tom outside in the early morning and poured cold water over him. Then she covered him with a wet cloth and put him to bed with heavy covers over him. When he was so hot that water formed on his skin, she was happy. She thought that this would help him. But Tom became sadder and sadder. She tried pouring hot water over him instead of cold. She tried less food. Soon Tom stopped fighting against what she did, and then she was sure that he was very ill indeed. Next, she heard of something named painkiller. She put some in her own mouth to taste it. It was like a mouthful of fire. She gave some to Tom and watched him. This painkiller had a strong result. The boy was wildly interested. He acted as if she had built a fire under him. She knew that she had found the right thing. And Tom knew that it was time for him to act. He thought of several plans. He decided to say that he liked painkiller. He asked for it so often that his aunt gave the whole container to him. Now... He could have painkiller at any time. She did not know that every day he put some in a hole in the floor. One day, as he was doing this, the cat came in and seemed to want some of the painkiller. You do not want it, Peter. But Peter continued to seem to ask for it. Are you sure? Peter was sure. You have asked for it. And I will give it to you. I'm a kind boy. But if you do not like it, remember that you asked. He opened the cat's mouth and put in some painkiller. Peter jumped high into the air and cried a wild cry. Then he started going around and around the room, running against chairs and tables. Next, he stood on his back feet and danced with cries of joy. Then he went faster around the room again. Aunt Polly arrived. He rolled over and over, gave one last great cry, and jumped through the open window. Tom was on the floor, weak from laughing. Tom, what is wrong with the cat? Cats always do that to show their joy. But Aunt Polly saw the painkiller. She knew what had happened. She caught Tom's ear and pulled him up, then hit him with a hand. Why did you do that to the cat? Because I am sorry that he has no aunt to care for him. He has no aunt? Why do you say that? Because if he had an aunt, she would give him a drink that burned his mouth and not think of his feelings. She would say, if the drink was good for a human, it would be good for a cat. Aunt Polly thought, if it hurt a cat, it might hurt a boy also. She put her hand on Tom's head. I was trying to help you, and I was trying to help Peter, and it helped him. I never saw him move so fast. He was smiling at her now. Oh, Tom, I will not give you any more painkiller. Go to school and try to be a good boy. Tom was early at school. He was often early now. Today, as he often did, he waited at the gate. He did not play. He was sick, he said, and he seemed sick. Jeff Thatcher came down the road, and Tom's face was brighter. 
But quickly, it was dark again. Jeff was alone. When Tom saw a girl's dress far away, he watched and watched. But the girl was never the right one. He entered the school and sat down to suffer. Then one more dress came through the gate. Tom's heart jumped. The next moment he was outside again, shouting, laughing, running after other boys, jumping over the fence, standing on his head. He was doing all this to make Becky Thatcher watch him. She never looked at him. Was it possible that she did not see him? He came running and shouting. He threw a boy's hat over the schoolhouse. He ran through a group of boys. Then he fell at her feet. She turned away with her nose raised high in the air. Some people always want other people to look at them. Her face became red. He stood straight and walked quietly away. Chapter 13 The Young Pirates Tom had decided now. He was sad and without hope. He was a boy with no friends. No person loved him. He had tried to do what was right, but they would not let him. Yes, they were forcing him into a bad life. He could now choose nothing else. He had come far from the village. He heard the distant school bell, and he knew that he would never, never hear it again. Tears fell from his eyes. Here he met his best friend, Joe Harper. Joe's eyes were filled with anger. It was easy to see that there was a great and sad purpose in his heart. Tom said that he was going to travel around the world, never to return to the village. He hoped that Joe would not forget him. And Joe had come to say the same to Tom. They were two souls with only one thought. Joe's mother had beaten him, but he had done nothing. She plainly wished to go away. Therefore, he was going. He hoped that she would be happy now. He hoped that she would never be sorry about sending her boy into the cold world to suffer and die. The two boys walked together. They agreed to be like brothers. They would never separate until they died. They began to plan. They decided to be pirates. Three miles south of the village, there was an island in the river. The Mississippi River was a mile wide there. The island was long and not very wide. It was covered with trees. No people lived on it. A few people lived on the river's shore near the island. It would be a good place for pirates. Then they met Huckleberry Finn and he joined them. They talked and then they separated. They would never meet again beside the river two miles north of the village at 12 that night. Tom knew where they would find a small boat. They would take it. Each boy would bring food and other useful things, if possible. Tom arrived with meat and a few other things. He stopped among the trees on a hill above the meeting place. There were many stars and it was very quiet. The great river lay like an ocean at rest. Tom listened for a moment, but the quiet was broken by no sound. Then he whistled gently. The whistle was answered from below. Tom whistled two more times and was answered again. Then a voice said, Who goes there? Tom Sawyer, the black pirate. Name your names. Huck Finn, the red-handed and Joe Harper, the destroyer of the seas. Tom had taken those names from his best loved books. Speak the word. 
Two voices spoke together. Blood! Tom went down the hill to join them. The destroyer of the seas had also brought meat, and Finn the red-handed had some tobacco. The black pirate said that they must also have fire. They went to a large riverboat that was near and took some of the fire burning there. They knew that there was no men on the boat. The boatmen were all in the village, but the boys moved very quietly and carefully. Pirates must be pirates. With Tom as captain of their ship, they left the shore and went into the middle of the river. From there, they let the moving river carry them along. They passed the distant village. Two or three lights showed where it was, peacefully sleeping. The black pirate stood in the boat looking for the last time at the scene of his early joys and latest sufferings. He wished that his aunt could see him now, facing the fearful future with a smile on his lips. After two hours, their boat touched the island. There was an old sail in the boat. They spread this over their supplies under the trees. They would sleep in the open air as pirates should. They built a fire and cooked some meat. It seemed wonderful to be eating in that wild, free manner in the forest, far from other people. They said that they would never return to a village or town again. After eating, they lay on the ground, talking. The fire lighted their faces and in the trees near them with a red light. Huck prepared to smoke some of his tobacco. Soon he was blowing out a cloud of smoke and the other pirates were wishing that they could do the same. Huck said, What do pirates do? Tom said, Oh, they enjoy life. They follow other ships and catch them and burn them. They take the money from those ships and put it in a deep hole in the ground on their island. And they kill the people on the ships. They carry the women to the island, said Joe. They do not kill the women. No, Tom agreed. Pirates are good. They do not kill the women. And the women are always beautiful. And their clothes are covered with gold and silver, said Joe. Whose clothes, said Huck. The pirates. Huck looked down at his own clothes. I am not dressed right for a pirate, he said, but these are my only clothes. The other boys told him that the fine clothes would come later when they began the adventures. Slowly their talk ended. The red-handed went to sleep quickly. The destroyer of the seas and the black pirate could not sleep so quickly. They began now to have some doubt. Had it been wrong to run away from home? Had it been wrong to take the meat? The meat did not belong to them. They decided they would never again take what did not belong to them. And with that decided, these pirates also were peacefully asleep. Chapter 14 Island Life Tom quietly leaves. Opening his eyes, Tom wondered where he was. He sat up and looked around. Then he remembered. It was cool, and the light was the grey colour of early morning. There was a delightful feeling of rest and peace in the deep quiet of the forest. A thin blue breath of smoke rose from the fire. Joe and Huck were yet asleep. Not far away, a bird called. Another answered. Slowly, the cool grey of the morning changed to white. More sounds were heard. The life of the forest began to show itself to the watching boy. Bugs appeared and started their day's labours. Birds were making many noises now. A big blue bird stopped very near to Tom. It turned its head to one side and sat watching its strange new neighbours. Small animals appeared, and they also looked at the boys and seemed to be talking to them. 
Perhaps they'd never seen a human being before. Perhaps they did not know whether or not to be afraid. Tom called to the other pirates. Within a few moments, they were all playing in the river near the shore. Their boat had been carried away, but this pleased them. They were certain now that they would never return to their village. Happy and hungry, they built their fire. Huck had found some good water to drink. While Joe cooked some meat, Tom and Huck went to the river and caught some fish. Joe cooked these with the meat. No fish had ever tasted so good. Then Huck smoked. After that, they all started to walk through the trees to see what they could discover. Then they found, much to, the, to their delight, nothing surprising. Their island was almost three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. It was very near to the shore on one side, but far from the shore where their village was. They played in the river often. It was the middle of the afternoon before they returned to their fire. They ate some meat again, and then they sat in the shade to talk. But the talk soon stopped. The quiet, the loneliness, were beginning to change their happiness. They began to be sad. Tom and Joe were thinking of home. Finn the red-handed, who had no hand, no home, was thinking of the places where he usually went to sleep. But they did not speak to each other of this weakness. Now they heard a distant sound. They looked at each other and listened. There was a long quiet and then the sound. Boom! Then a long, long quiet and then again. Boom! We must go and see. They jumped up and ran to the shore near the town. The trees there were small and grew thickly. Through them, the boys looked across the water. They saw a big river boat. It was the boat they crossed the river many times every day. Now it was coming slowly down the river. It was crowded with people. There were many small boats around it. And then from the river boat came a cloud of white smoke and then another boom. I understand now, said Tom. Some person is drowned. That is right, said Huck. They did that last summer when Bill Turner was drowned. A big gun makes that boom, and then the body rises to the top of the water. I wish that I was on that riverboat now, said Joe. I wonder who is drowned, said Huck. They continued to listen and watch. Then a thought came into Tom's mind like a sudden light. Boys, I know who is drowned. They are looking for us. This was a wonderful thing to know. Hearts were breaking for them. Tears were falling. People were sorry that they had not always been kind to them. The whole town was talking about them. This was fine. It was good to be a pirate. All doubt of that was gone. As darkness came, the riverboat returned to her usual business. The pirates returned to their fire. They were joyful that they were so important and were causing so much sadness. They caught more fish to eat, and then they talked about what the village people were thinking and saying. But as the night grew darker, they stopped talking and sat looking into the fire. Tom and Joe thought of persons at home who were not enjoying all of this. Joe began to speak of returning to the village. Tom laughed at him. Huck joined with Tom. Huck fell asleep. Then Joe fell asleep. Tom sat for a long time watching the others. Then he stood up. He found two pieces of thin wood on which he could write. After writing on the wood, he put one piece in Joe's hat. He put the other in his pocket. Then carefully, he moved away among the trees. When he knew that they could not hear him, 
he began to run toward the river. Chapter 15 Tom learns what is happening. A few minutes later, Tom was walking into the water toward the shore where the riverboat was tied. The stream was not wide here, but it was long. It carried Tom south, but after a while he arrived at the river's edge. He found a good place and pulled himself out of the water. He began walking north through the trees near the shore. He arrived at an open area across the river from the village. The riverboat was lying there. Everything was quiet under the stars. Watching with both his eyes, he entered the water again. There was a small boat tied behind the large boat. Soon he was pulling himself into the small boat. After a minute or two, he heard a bell. The river boat began to move. He knew that this was the last time it would cross the river that night. Twelve minutes later, the boat stopped. Tom was quickly in the water again, swimming to the shore. Soon, he had jumped over the fence behind his aunt's house. He looked through a window into a lighted room. There sat Aunt Polly, Sid, Mary and Joe Harper's mother. They were talking. They were beside the bed and the bed was between them and the door. Tom went to the door and opened it quietly. He thought that he might be able to go inside without being seen. He began moving carefully on his knees. I feel a wind. Is that door open? said Aunt Polly. How strange. Many strange things are happening now, said. Go and close the door. Quickly Tom went under the bed. Sid did not see him. But, said Aunt Polly, he was not bad. He was only wild and full of life. Like any young animal, he did not wish to do bad things. And no boy ever had a kinder heart. She began to weep. My Joe was the same. He was not really bad, and he was always kind. Now I shall never see him again. I am sorry now for so many things. Only yesterday the cat. Weeping, Aunt Polly told about the cat and the painkiller. Tom was weeping a little now. He could hear Mary weeping also. Had he really always been a good boy? It was quite surprising to think this, but now he was beginning to believe it. He wished to rush out from under the bed. He wished to fill his aunt with joy, but he remained still and listened. Their small boat had been found five or six miles down the river. Now hope for them was gone. On Sunday, the whole village would pray in the church for the boys' souls. Mrs. Harper went home. Sid and Mary went to bed. Then Aunt Polly prayed for Tom. Her words and her old voice were filled with love. Tom's tears began falling again. Then she got into bed. She talked to herself and she turned over again and again. Tom remained quiet for a long time, but at last she was still. Now the boy came out and looked down at her. He loved her and he was very sorry for her. He took from his pocket the piece of wood with his writing on it. He placed it on a table. She would see it there in the morning. But then a new thought came to him. He considered it. His face grew bright. He put the wood into his pocket again. Then he kissed his aunt's lips and went out the door. 
he returned to the river and to the riverboat. There was a man who guarded the boat, but he would be sleeping. Tom knew that. It was easy to take the small boat. He got into it and moved it first up the river, then crossed to the other shore. He had often crossed the river in a small boat, and he knew how to do it. He considered taking the small boat to the island. A real pirate would keep the boat, but people would try to find it, and they might find the boys also. He got out of the boat and walked south along the shore. At daylight, he could look straight across the stream and see the island. He rested. Then he entered the water. Soon, he was on the island. He heard Joe say, No, Tom is true, Huck. He will return. What has he been doing, I wonder? Here I am, cried Tom, stepping out from among the trees. In a short time, they had caught more fish and were eating them. Tom told his adventures. Then Tom found a place in the shade. There he was able to sleep until noon. The end of part three.